the Holy Gospel according to John 17, John 17, 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy One, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. For the Word of God in Scripture, for the Word of God among us, for the Word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Now, if you hear it, Scripture reading like that from the Gospels, and you think a little bit to yourself, does that really sound like Jesus talking? That would be understandable. Because there's a few things that might make you think that or wonder that. One, this language is highly stylized and highly theological, which is typical in the Gospel of John, but very different from anything we hear from Jesus in the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and those three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels, meaning seen together, because uh, they cover a lot of the same material, sometimes borrow that from each other or from similar sources, uh, use a similar style, and all of that. Uh, but John's Gospel stands alone among the four as being completely unique, and it was also the last one written, so it's furthest from the historical events uh, that it narrates. So that's one thing, if you think, boy, does that really sound uh, how I'm used to hearing Jesus talk? The second is we have, of course, a prayer here, Jesus praying to God, but interestingly talking about himself in third person, which is a little odd, you know, instead of saying me, he says glorify your son, or refers to himself as Jesus Christ uh, in the third person. That seems a little unusual. And saying things that God presumably already knows. And so it has kind of a, a stained glass language about it, right? It feels like kind of stuffy, theological, churchy language. Kind of like when someone gives a sermon during a prayer. You ever heard that? No, I'm sure I've been guilty of that. Um, and then finally, Jesus in this prayer talks about things that have already happened with phrases like, I finished the work you gave me to do. And I am no longer in the world. And he's using the past tense as if speaking about his death and resurrection and looking back on it from some time, from some time forward. But as this arrives in our text, those things haven't happened yet. Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet, hasn't died, hasn't been raised. And so all of that lends itself toward making this text perhaps not so much a verbatim prayer that Jesus prayed, but a commentary on a prayer uh, by the writer of John's Gospel, or a commentary perhaps in the form of a prayer, uh, a way of teaching and reminding his first audience of things that they value and believe about God and Jesus and so on. Does that make sense? A little? Maybe a little. I just wanted to mention that in case you hear this reading and, and wonder what, what's going on here. It almost sounds like Jesus just graduated from seminary and is trying to show off. <laughs> but the part of the prayer that strikes me as a deep longing of Jesus that we are still so badly in need of comes right at the end. 
right? as Jesus and as God, that we may be one as they are one. A prayer for unity and oneness. And you might think that feels like an odd thing to pray for so early on in the life of the church. Weren't they all of one mind and heart? In fact, we read in Acts that shortly after Pentecost, which is next week, by the way, that all the believers were together and had everything in common. Which is a beautiful picture of unity. I believe they truly had such moments of unity and oneness. But it's also true that the early church struggled with unity like we do now. They had a number of factions. Some felt they should follow Peter and James. Some felt they should follow Paul or John or Mary Magdalene or Apollos. There were differing opinions about who to follow, what to focus on, how to settle differences and so on. In fact, we have a record of Paul and Barnabas having such a serious argument about who to take with them on one of their missionary journeys that in fact they go their separate ways never to see each other again. But thankfully today we don't see such divisions in the church. All Christians get along and love each other and are of one mind and heart. Isn't that your experience? I'm sure you've heard the story about the uh, Baptist who was marooned alone on a deserted island. And uh, he lived there for several years before a passing ship happened to see smoke from his fire and turned aside to see what was happening. And when some of the crew made their way by boat to the island, they found the man in the three huts he had built. And they asked him, well, what are these three huts? And he said, oh, well, this is where I live and this is where I go to church. And they said, well, what's the third hut? Oh, well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> That one just spoke. <laughs> but there's also uh, the story about the time the pastor and his choir director got into a disagreement. One week, the preacher, well, this started to show up in worship, choir director, pastor. One week, the preacher preached on commitment and how you should dedicate yourselves to service, and the director then led the choir in singing, I shall not be moved. <laughs> The next Sunday, the preacher preached on giving and tithing and how we should all gladly give to the Lord and the work of the church. And the choir director then led them in the song, Jesus Paid It All. <laughs> the next Sunday, the preacher preached on gossiping and how we should watch our tongues. And the hymn that day was, I Love to Tell the Story. <laughs> Well, the preacher became disgusted over the situation, and the next Sunday he told the congregation he was considering resigning and asked for their prayers as he waited on an answer. And the choir then got up and sang, Oh, why not tonight? <laughs> and then when the preacher resigned the next week, he told the church that Jesus had led him there and Jesus was taking him away. And the choir then sang, What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> That's pretty helpful, but... <laughs> had to warm us up before we're going to get serious stuff. You know, because all joking aside, right, we know Christians are divided. Right? Maybe as divided as ever. Just think back to the last three years, six years, <coughs> eight years. Think about your own experience with friends, family, Neighbors, co-workers, so many arguments. Who to vote for, whether to get vaccinated, whether to wear a mask, what to do about this, that, or the other thing. Ugh. We are polarized in a painful way. And what message might it send if the church, instead of being polarized, was a place of unity and healing? But it can feel so impossible. One pastor reflects on it this way. He says, the biggest problem about the divide that we face is that it's not merely ideological, it's personal. It's not just a disagreement about the best way forward, but about who has the moral high ground. People don't just disagree, they imagine the folks they disagree with as bad people who must be defeated. I felt that way at times. And 
And then people in the middle are also bad because their compromise is letting the bad guys win. And this pastor goes on to say, for the nation, this tug of war seemingly, seemingly will not end with one side accepting the other's victory. The ideological gap is too wide. He says, I don't know how far down the road the finish line will be crossed, but the march toward a national breakup seems well underway. If we don't turn the ship around, we in the church are headed for the same fate. Our unity is in the process of being shattered as we take sides on every single issue. He then says, the scriptures say that if we hate our brother, then we can't say that we love God. And yet we have Christians posting about how stupid their fellow Christians are. Something, he says, has to change. And it's hard. There's no easy answers to this. And we can't gloss over what are real differences that have real outcomes in the world. But perhaps we can remember to see each other as fellow human beings. I remember a few years ago when many of us were fighting to expand Holland's non-discrimination ordinance to include people of varying abilities and LGBTQ plus folks. A view that seems to me is rooted in a belief in our oneness and, and unity as people, right? No one person should be discriminated against. We all belong to each other. And yet we had to fight for this because there was opposition to this kind of unity. And I remember the day of the city council meeting and, and the vote, and I was sitting in our backyard thinking about what I might say if I had the chance to talk at the council meeting. And I remember seeing a, a bird in the sky flying high above me, maybe a hawk, and I just kind of imagined what does it look like from where that bird is flying way high above? What does the view from there look like? The trees look smaller, the houses look smaller, the people look even smaller. You've had this experience if you've ever flown anywhere, you're at the window seat, and you look out, and it almost looks like a toy train set, right? How are those real houses and real vehicles and things moving around? It gives you a different sense. The first manned mission of the moon, Apollo 8, was also the first time that astronauts were able to photograph the whole Earth from space. On December 24, 1968, astronauts Commander Frank Borman, Commander Module Pilot Jim Lovell, and Lunar Module Pilot William Anders entered lunar orbit. And William Anders captured this iconic picture of the Earth that day, which came to be known as Earthrise. And he was so in awe of this view of Earth, he proclaimed, Oh my God, look at that view over there! That's the Earth coming up! Wow! And he also said, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing that we discovered is Earth. This shift in perspective began to be called the overview effect. The overview effect is a shift in awareness which allows us, which allows astronauts at least, and us through them, to see Earth from outer space as a tiny, fragile ball of life. Later, astronaut Michael Collins would say, the thing that really surprised me was that it, that is the Earth, projected an air of fragility. And why, I don't know. I don't know to this day. I had this feeling it's tiny. It's shiny. It's beautiful. It's fragile. It's home. It's home. Think of that word. Each of us comes from and belongs to a home of one sort or another, and if we live with others in that home, whether humans or pets, we consider them as family or as close friends, the kind of people we would do anything for. And the overview effect reminds us that all humans share the same home. We are all family. And so while I don't have easy answers to what it is that will help us be more unified, I do lean into what many of the mystics say, that we are already one, and our job is to remember 
that. And I find what helps put me in that place of shifted perspective is contemplative prayer, meditation, silence. And putting myself in a place of quiet and stillness, whether that's sitting in the backyard looking at the trees and the birds, or finding a favorite coffee shop and being still with that mug of warmth around the busyness of what's happening around me. Those moments can help us lean into and remember what is already true. And when we open our hearts in such a way, we remember our unity. Thomas Merton relates a, a similar experience he had in a crowded street corner back in the 60s. And he shares about it in his book, Conjectures of the Guilty Bystander. He says, in Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people. That they were mine and I theirs. That we could not be alien to one another, though we were, in fact, total strangers. This changes nothing in the sense and value of my solitude, he says, for it is, in fact, the, the function of my solitude to make one realize such things with clarity. In other words, taking that time in silence and aloneness can open us to the expanse around us. My solitude, however, he says, is not my own. It is because I am one with them that I owe it to them to be alone. And when I am alone, they are not they, but my own self. There are no strangers. If only we could see each other that way all the time. And so the longing that Jesus has that we might be one is this invitation to remember and to move toward what already is. And so when we see people who belong to different religions, or the same religion, but with different beliefs, when we see them as siblings, instead of opponents, we move toward oneness. When we see people who speak a different language and come from a different homeland as friends and not as a threat, we move toward oneness. When we support friends who have struggles that are different than our own, and yet we say, how can I help? We move toward oneness. When we're willing to learn from our neighbor, even and perhaps especially our politically different neighbor, we move toward oneness. And when someone has a different belief about God than we do, and we don't try to railroad them into changing their belief to align with ours, we move toward oneness. As our readings earlier invited us, we need to gather again around the fire and hear each other's stories. We need to see people, even people we highly dislike, as if we just turned a corner and we're seeing them for the first time. After all, no matter where we go on this tiny, fragile planet, and no matter who we meet, we are already home. Amen. 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 So, I invite you to stand if you're able and join us in our song.